Welcome. Um, as Laurie said, thanks very much for joining us. It's great to see some familiar faces. Um, Liz and I are really enjoying uh, getting to know you all and finding out more about your businesses. Um, we're obviously sorry that we can't do today's event in person, but all things restrictions, we decided it was safer to do it uh, virtually still at the moment. Um, we know there's been quite a lot of Zoom over the last few months, indeed almost years. Um, so we're not going to keep you too long, but we do have some great guest speakers along to share their industry knowledge and insights. So just a quick run through of today's agenda. Um, Laurie's obviously given us a, a quick wee welcome. Um, we're going to give you a quick update on the project, where we're at to date, where we've been, if you like. Um, we'll have a wee recap on one or two of the key points from workshop one that we did. Um, we're going to chat a little bit more about the product development for success. Um, and then most importantly, we're going to hand over to the experts. So we've got uh, Karen from Rabi is going to give us a tour, a tour and product development overview. Uh, we've got Ewan and Rebecca from Expedia who are going to give an overview from the point of an online travel agent. Um, we're going to chat a little bit more about marketing to the travel trade. And then we have our expert from Germany, Wilfred, will be giving us some key insights into working with the German speaking market. Now, we are going to do a round the table sort of Q&A at the end, um, but I suppose just to point out that there is a chat box, so as any pertinent questions arise as we go through, so once you drop them into the chat box, um, we will endeavour to capture all of them at the end. Just a couple of housekeeping things, if, if you can keep yourselves on mute, unless uh, you're speaking, we will ask later on for the, do the Q&A for you to sort of unmute and ask any questions. Um, but just so that we're keeping things running seamlessly. So without any further ado, let's tell you where we've been. So we started off back in October with a couple of in-person workshops. We had 46 businesses attending, which was fantastic. We then did a wee virtual session in November and had a further 17 businesses from the region come along. Liz and I have been frantically wor working around the region, sadly, mostly virtually and not in person just at the moment, but we're going to rectify that next month. We've had about 75 one-to-one -one meetings and we're ongoing with various pieces of follow-up in relation to them. Um, today's workshop is all about the next step of working with the travel trade and I think there's about 40 businesses booked to attend, which is fantastic. Um, and then of course, we are capturing all the data, travel trade product guide content from you all. So this is a bit of a plea. We need your submissions, please, um, required by the end of February, because then it's all going to be uploaded into the Travel Trade Product Guide. So if you haven't completed your forms, online forms yet, please do so. If you have any challenges at all during the process, um, please give us a shout. We're going to touch on a couple of the things that are causing um, confusion later on today. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand on to Liz. Right, I'm just sending someone a passcode. Um, so yeah, so we thought we would start with um, the, the the previous workshop. Obviously, if uh, you want to listen to the whole thing, there's an online, there's a recording of it, and um, Rachel can send it on to you. But we just really wanted to focus on um, the things that uh, are kind of very per pertinent to product development and 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 bookable product. So. Um, Oh, sorry, Karen. Yeah, I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting. I can't actually pass it on myself. <laughs> so yes, benefits of working with the travel trade. Um, can there, can, there's people having sound issues, Karen. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, is there? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. um, hmm. Although no, well, I've sent the password. Sorry. I'm just going to have to crack on, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just, yeah, key benefits, key pointers um, about working with the travel trade that I just want to re-emphasize um, that, um, so, so the key, the, so I keep getting distracted by admitting people. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll do the admitting. Can, right. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Start again. Um, so the things I really wanted to emphasize uh, you know, this is the this is the moment where we're trying to access new markets, extend your customer base in a time when there's quite a lot of turbulence in the market. Um, you know, these are opportunities for new channels to market with your business. 
um, and a bit of a wider reach. Um, one key thing, and I'm sure some of you are aware of it already, is the opportunity for advanced bookings. Um, in the earlier workshop, we just advised you about the sort of long lead-in time to to thing to to bookings, but um, you know, the trade will book in advance. So there's also the opportunity for supplementary bookings to what you what you get, you know, because you're extending your market. Um, and also something very key is that your product is displayed um, where the customer is actually looking for a holiday. So whether that's a website or a brochure or a social media post, it's in the right and it's in the right language. So someone, um, you, your, your, your product can be translated into a myriad of different languages and, and German obviously uh, being one of them. So if we just move on now to trade needs and wants, um, so just, just going back to this is really what we've all been working about over the last few months is about, about meeting the needs of the trade, being trade friendly, creating bookable product. And so what does that mean? What books, boxes do we, are we trying to tick here? Um, well, we talked about in the last workshop about um, having clear description of what it is you're offering um, and an operator told me in the early days of working with the travel trade, if you've got some copy I can cut and paste and pop into my itinerary, that would be fantastic. And that has always stayed with me because they're, they're, they're just they're looking for something quick and easy, relevant, inspirational. Um, rates, of course, and we'll come on to rates um, shortly uh, at the end of our little bit here. Um, and then I think, you know, in the arena we're in at the moment with the pandemic, uh, operators are looking for fresh new ideas. They're responding to themes. They're responding to their own customer sentiment in the country that they live in. Um, and there is a greater need for easy, straightforward options. So that, again, is still where we are looking to um, make it nice and easy for everybody. Um, and I think that's just... The, the, we can talk about that more, but these are just the little things that we referred to going on from the last workshop. Um, so moving on, Karen. Okay. Why is that not moving there? Hang on. Oh, there with. <laughs> right, Liz, if anybody else is trying to, I'll, I'll let you, as I do the next slide, let you admit anybody else. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So we really want to touch a bit more about on product development for success and creating your bookable product. Now, it is so important to have defined product that is readily bookable for the travel trade to be able to package up, distribute and market to their audience. Um, if you can imagine the number of properties and attractions, tours that they work with, they just don't have time or resource to be making contact directly for each individual inquiry. So they're showcasing not only Murray's Bayside region, but wider Scotland, UK, and many of the bigger agents feature worldwide destinations. So this is why we keep hammering on about the fact that your offering's got to be succinct, defined, bookable, and readily accessible for them to be able to include you. Um, this will be touched on again, I'm sure, by Karen and Rebecca Newen in due course when they give us a bit of an oversight from their point of view. But let's just take a moment and recap. So, you know, have a little think again about what is your base product. We're obviously, many of you have had the one-to-ones, we're getting the forms coming back through, which is perfect. But, you know, for those that have not, this is a good time to rethink about, you know, exactly what your base core product is. So if you are offering accommodation, is it just the accommodation or do you offer it with breakfast? Do you have dinner included? Do you offer a welcome drink or a welcome hamper? Um, if you're an attraction, is it entered to your attraction? Does it include a guided tour? What is included? You have to think about what is included in your base product. product. And have a think about your unique proposition as well. There's a lot of um, attractions, accommodation providers out there. So what is the unique part of your proposition that's going to drive the travel trade to you? Have you got a bar with 500 whiskies? Um, or are you offering homemade cull and skink? Um, can you run around the region with a running group, taking in the local beer on your travels? Um, are you a whiskey expert? Have you won awards for the best garden? Really have a think and drill down to what these key unique propositions are that you have for your business. So select your best fit trade offering, maybe just two to three key things. You've got to remember to keep it fairly simple. 
you might have quite a spectrum of different products that you can offer, but offering five or six different options, tour options or accommodation packages can get a little bit confusing um, for the, the travel trade in terms of booking it, but also from your own point of view, operationally to manage. Um, what is your product name? Does it do what it says on the tin, if you like? So if you say you're offering a, a private garden tour with the head gardener, then really that is what you have to deliver to make sure that your product name is reflecting what you are delivering. And now a key point, how do the trade find you and put the product? It's all very well having your lovely product uh, proposition sitting there, but you've got to be able to be found. So are you visible online? Can they book through your website? Or do they need to book direct, which is fine, but if so, who do they call and how quickly do you respond? Um, you know, there's no point in, in some uh, a tour operator making up an email, sending an email, making a phone call and it taking a week to get back because, you know, they're trying to finalise tours and, and sell on to their end client. So it's all about replying in a timely manner. Pricing. This is the age old chestnut. We're going to come back to that in a minute because that's the, the, the complicated part. Um, terms and conditions. This is really incorporating deposits, prepayment, cancellations. Now, this is a very tricky area and it's very hard to get it just right at the moment as we're in the tail end of a pandemic. Um, it's got to work for you as much as it's got to work for the travel trade partner. So what I did is I reached out to a couple of operators over the last few days to get a steer on what their thoughts are at the moment. And um, Karen and also Expedia will, will probably have some maybe an insight on this as well. But um, I did get a couple of bits of feedback. So from one operator, Cashel, they advise that their current standard cancellation is 28 days for groups. So you might, you know, and just get some top tips from this if you're still trying to finalise what your offering is. So they're suggesting 28 days prior for groups. Um, for individuals, depending on the size of the property and the location, it can be about 72 hours, uh, some 14 days prior. It's really dependent on how rural the property is and what the opportunities are to resell. So if you're in a city centre or a town, you've probably got more chance of reselling so you could potentially work to a 72 hour cancellation. If you're a little bit more rural, you might have to keep that a little bit longer, but it's got to work for you. And there is obviously a spectrum of opportunities and, and different terms out there. Um, for payment, ideally, the operators like to pay post stay um, because by then they will have been paid. And if there's been any challenges at all with the booking, then they've got a little bit of something in the bank to go back. However, since COVID, uh, most suppliers are recognize, are asking for prepayment and the tour operators are recognising this is the thing. So that was the feedback from Cashel. Um, I also reached out to Circle Hotels. Um, for individual bookings, they work on three days, 72 hours. So that seems to be quite a common number for an individual booking in terms of cancellation. So if they cancel 72 hours out, then there's no penalty um, and the travel trade seems to be okay with this. Within 72 hours, it's fully payable at 100%. And then they have varying group terms there for more than five rooms, um, group terms, and they're suggesting 60 days out, 25% is payable if it cancels, 30 days out, 50%, and 10 days out, 100%. So there's a, a lot of different things out there in the market in terms of terms of so it has to work for you, but it obviously has to be workable for the, the travel trade as well. And I guess at the moment we have to remember that we still need to remain as flexible as possible as we're still at the end of the pandemic. Um, there's issues with people having to isolate or not being able to travel, etc, etc. And then finally, under the sort of product development for success and creating your product, have a think about partnership working. Can you collaborate with your new neighbours to create product? Do you work with local suppliers, tie in your accommodation with a distillery tour or bring in a supplier to do a tasting? There's an endless list of opportunities there, but ultimately we want the, the guests to come to the region and stay for a few days, so it's really important that we're offering comprehensive product to encourage them to do so. Right, let's talk a little bit about the age-old chestnut of pricing. This is, the, this is the challenge, so this element is causing uh, most confusion. So don't worry if, if you've still got questions related to this, that's what Liz and I are here to help with. I suppose what we've just got to remember here is that travel trade partners are an extension of your own marketing networks. They've got a wide ranging reach, so look at commissions as marketing spend. 
Remember, you wouldn't achieve that wide reach without their help and distribution channels. They do have to make the margin, which covers their own marketing spend in turn along with operating their businesses. So you do need to offer them either commission, so commission is a fee that a business pays to the agent in exchange for completing the sale, if you like. Commission is generally a percentage of the revenues generated. Or if you don't want to work on a commission basis, you have to offer a net trade rate. And that is a net rate that you're offering to the travel trade after you've taken you know, any deductions before you, you take the deductions before you pass the rate on, if that makes sense. So I guess we'll, we'll talk about a wee bit, bit more about this in the next slide, but when you are setting that pricing and commission levels and et cetera, et cetera, do have a think about other considerations, um, such as, what is your break-even point? What are your costs? What margin do you need to be making to sustain your business? And are you going to offer rates for groups as well as for individuals? Um, can you do bespoke pricing on inquiries? So if you've got something that's a little bit more unique and are happy to create bespoke packages when you get that inquiry, happy to do so. But um, you need to just highlight in your product guide that that is an option. Um, should you look at adding some seasonality into your rates to encourage some off-peak bookings? So we all know that the peak summer months, um, prices can be quite high, but what about maybe putting in some lower rates in the off-season to encourage more traffic coming your way? And then have you set your rates for 2023 and beyond? Um, I know probably Karen will be touching on this, but you know, 2022, we're pretty much done, although we're not, we're just about to hit that season, but everything's contracted now. So you really need to be looking at 2023 and beyond. Remember the lead time the tour operators are working with to create their product and brochures. Okay. So again, just a little bit more on the, the, the pricing side of things. So really the choice is yours. It's about whether you offer the trade a lower rate up front that they then take and mark up. And this would take out the need for any future commission payments or you offer a commissionable rate whereby the trade pay the full price and then you in turn give them commission on sale and generally commission invoices are received after the state or visit and then need processed. So it's really entirely up to you to work with what suits your business. Many of the businesses probably uh, just want to offer one or the other option unless you're slightly bigger and you've maybe got capacity and manpower to be able to and systems in place to allow you to offer both but it really is entirely up to you. So if I just talk from an accommodation point of view for a minute, because I've been working with most of the accommodation providers, for example, if you want to achieve a room rate of £100, for ease of maths, let's pick £100, um, and then you, you're usually selling your room rate £100, you've got to think, well, I'm going to take commission off that, so that's going to eat into that. Be a little bit bold. Maybe set your rate at £110 then. And that will then mean once you've paid your commission, you're still achieving 99, which is pretty close to the 100 that you wanted to if you're offering them, for example, 10% commission. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is, you know what your margins are, you know what your costs are, you know what, what the rates are you need to make for your, your room. So set your public or dynamic or best available pricing, whatever way you want to call it, your consumer facing pricing, that little bit higher to allow for commission to be paid. Or if it's a net rate and you're still trying to achieve this £100 rate, which is your rate that you, you really want to, to get for that room, again, make your public facing, your consumer facing rate £110, and then you can sell that net £100 rate onto the tour operator, and they've got that margin to mark up. I don't know, Liz, do you want to add something there from the sort of commission or net on the um, attraction side of things? I think a lot of our discussions were about um, net rates um, as an attraction, for example, it is difficult to have too many rate structures. Um, so, you know, when you're working with um, uh, rates, it's about being very clear that this is a net rate that the operator can then put their um, um, markup on top of um, and making sure that it still gives the operator a chance to um, to build that package without making it excessively high, you know, and it's still the same principle as Karen talked about, about working out what your, um, what your 
net rate should be that you actually are able to make money and then putting and knowing that the operator can still put something on top of that and be around about the actual consumer selling price. Um, we talked a lot about bespoke and as Karen mentioned bespoke, that for bespoke, you know, you also need to remember that you're actually perhaps putting a package together that is only available to the trade. Something so therefore you 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 don't need to worry too much about your consumer prices, but you obviously need to work what is what is a viable rate, and you can pull that all together and still call it your trade rate. Um, and if you are free, um, because we should cover what's a free um, attraction or experience, you still may have some costed options where you can add in rates that are for trade. Um, even if the margins are a pound, two pounds, something like that, you know, when you're dealing with 12 pounds, you know, uh, a net rate, a public rate of 12 pounds, you, you may be working with a net of, of uh, 150 or uh, of taking it down to 10 or 11 pounds. So that's all still possible. That's me, Karen. Okay. Let me just move my screen. There you go. Let's you. <laughs> so, so before we move on to the main event and our speakers, um, we, Karen and I both wanted to reflect a little bit on our working with the region and, and where we are and what we're working through. And I think across, you know, both of us is the collective aim is to be trade friendly. And, you know, that, we've talked about that already, but um, I've shared with a few of the people I've been working with um, Highland Safari's website. They're a company in Persia. You, you probably know them very trade friendly. They've got a, a website with trade web pages, very uh, easy descriptions of the tours and how long they last and a very clear trade net rate. Now you don't have to, now that's obviously extremely trade friendly and it's showing your willingness to work with the trade. You don't have to do all of those things, but it's, it's useful um, uh, to have something that is for trade, whether it's a PDF or a product sheet or whatever, um, which goes along uh, a little bit to help that uh, relationship building. Um, having, uh, just having worked with um, operators, you've got a little bit of a shop window opportunity to, so if you've got a tour that you offer um, or an experience, the ideal thing would be to do, put a short summer of it together um, um, and draw out the essentials and the USPs. You know, maybe it's a dark skies tour something that an operator may, may not have even um, have thought about, but because you've put it out there in your shop window, as, as we say, then they might think about developing it further. I always say if it's not there, it won't sell. Um, you might want to draw out multiple, you might have a product that has multiple different offerings. You might have self-catering, you might have a garden, you might have a cafe. Um, it's about thinking actually the trade, what would work with the trade, what would suit me, what would suit them. Um, so if it's a tour with the gardener, let's get that out there. Um, uh, working with the, the Keith to Dufftown train, we talked a lot about um, all the experiences round about the train, but actually our aim was to focus on what the train experience would be all about. How long would the journey be? What you could do on the train? And the other bits can be fitted around by the operators. Um, yes, just about drawing out what what's, what's, doesn't have to be all the experiences you offer, just some of them. Um, and we've spent quite a lot of time over this and, you know, we're all going forward where we want the time to be quick and efficient for our operators. So, as we said about bespoke, have a few of your bespoke packages ready to go because timing is key. You know, across the board in the region, we've got local experts, award winning and unique experiences, food and drink, championed obviously by our whiskey, but also there's so much more collectively around the region, all our experiences gathered together which will help the trade create that compelling destination um, and convince them to route via Bowie Speyside or, or reroute via uh, east of the A9. Um, so that, that was, that was um, sort of just some of the discussions we've had on the visitor attraction and experience side. And just from my point of view on the accommodation side, I mean, we're working with such a diverse range of businesses. I just wanted to highlight there really is a place for everything. Um, we're working with many different inbound international and domestic markets, and they're all looking for something just a little bit different. So 
you know, in the region, we know we've got available everything from glamping and camping to exclusive use and so much more in between. Um, and there's some great, great, from my point of view, the accommodation providers product I've been looking at is, is fantastic. There's some great product. So, you know, I think just to sort of recap, some businesses are going to offer just commissionable rates. Um, some are already offering group and FIT net rates and are going to keep this going and just adjust rates for 2023 and beyond. Um, some properties are not of a size to take groups, so the focus is very much on individuals. Um, some will be offering a minimum stay line, such as three nights. So all of this is fine, so long as we are clear in our communications what it is that we are offering. And that's why, you know, it's getting the, the content right for these product forms that are going to go into the product guide is really, really important. So, you know, you don't have to do something completely different that isn't going to work for your business model. We just have to make sure that it, it's clear and what you are offering, offering is sellable. So I hope that makes some kind of um, sense. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our guest speakers, um, starting off with Karen from Rabbies. Um, I'm sure she's, she's going to be able to introduce herself, but just to both Karen and to um, Ewan and Rebecca, um, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. They'll take about 15, 20 minutes um, each on their presentations. I suggest if you put questions in the chat, we'll save all that till the end or um, just save them and we'll, we'll open up discussion at the end. Um, so very much thanks for um, joining us and can we try and get um, your, you to share your screen, Karen? Yeah, I'm unsharing, Karen, that should leave you free to share. And that should be me sharing, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic, I've got loads of thumbs up. Fabulous. So thank you so much for that introduction, Liz. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Karen. And I have more than 20 years experience in tourism. I'm not going to specify more than that. And, you know, not giving away my age, but a lot of years in tourism. And uh, I have been working for different tour operators, for example, CIE Tours, if you're familiar with them, US based company. I've also worked for DMCs like Abbey, Ireland, and UK. And I'm currently the head of contracting and product for Rabbies. And for those of you who are not familiar with Rabbies, we are a tour operator. We run scheduled tours on 16-seater coaches, so it's mini coaches. And we're quite a big operation. Uh, we carried, before the pandemic, obviously, we carried about 170,000 passengers on our coaches in Scotland alone in a year. And that's more than 150 different nationalities from across the world. But in addition to our scheduled tours, we also have an FIT program. We have an FIT brochure that we sell exclusively to the trade. So if you look at our website, you wouldn't see this product. And we also do ad hoc groups. So we're kind of a hybrid of a tour operator and DMC. So we look at the business from all different angles there. So that's a little bit about rabbis. But um, what I am here to talk to you about today is product development and coming up with new product and new itineraries. So if I am going to come up with some new products, I need to ask myself a few questions and I need to consider things like which markets is this for? Um, what type of itinerary? Um, what are the trends at the moment? Am I creating itineraries for groups or for FITs? And from your perspective, what products are available for me? What, what can I create? What's there to include? So let's deep dive into these questions a little bit more. So for example, markets, which markets am I creating an itinerary for? Because different markets will look for different things. To give you a few examples, the US market, uh, very much about history, heritage, looking for four star properties and above, uh, German markets, I know Wilfred will be telling you a lot more about that. They tend to be a little bit more active, happy with a uh, three star as long as it's clean with accommodation. And the Scandinavian market, let's be honest, it's all about alcohol for them. I'm allowed to say that I'm Swedish before anyone gets upset. 
Uh, and again, three star properties, as long as it's clean and nice, they are okay with that. So different markets have different expectations. Second question is what type of itineraries are popular? Are there any trends I should be considering? And obviously the biggest market is for general itineraries. People are only coming to Scotland once, they wanna see a little bit of everything. But there are also some interesting trends at the moment um, for themed itineraries. Food and drink, there's demand for food and drink. Activities, people want to be out outdoors and do things. From the US, the biggest hobby in the US at the moment is ancestral research, so looking for their um, ancestors. Second biggest hobby in the US at the moment is knitting. So there you go, if you've got knitting patterns or knitting wool or whatever, the US market is great for you. Film and TV is also very much in demand. We are seeing at the moment, there's a new Outlander series going. We're seeing a huge demand in our Outlander tour, which visits your area as well. So part of my job is to research trends and to know what people are looking for. Next question for me, is this itinerary that I'm planning, is it for groups or for FITs? And if I'm planning itineraries for groups, what do I need to consider? Well, it depends on the type of group. So for example, for scheduled tours, and I'm going to use rabbits as an example because it's easy enough. From rabbits' perspective, we don't include attractions. So we need flexibility. We need to give final numbers on the day. And a lot of the time, passengers want to pay direct, which means that I need to work with suppliers who can work with these kinds of um, uh, conditions. And if it's for big groups, if I'm looking at the big coaches, uh, in that case, what I also need to think about is access. What suppliers has, can accept a big group? Do they have parking? Is there access for a coach? So I need to consider these things. And if we continue, if it's not for groups I'm looking for, if it's for FITs, one of the biggest questions I have to ask myself, if I'm going to plan an FIT itinerary, how are people going to travel? Is it going to be self-drive or maybe rail tours? That's in demand at the moment, the sustainable travel uh, link there. Or is it going to be chauffeur drives? In that case, are there experienced chauffeur companies out there? And one thing that you may want to consider when it comes to FIT products is that at the moment, there's a lot of talk about coming up with unique luxury behind the scenes products. And that's great because people want to do something different. They want the Instagram experience. They want to have that bragging right on, on social media. But no one's going to have a full itinerary of just unique and luxury and behind the scenes stuff. So don't forget your basic product as well. If you're an attraction, have a standard tour as well as the warehouse experiences or whatever it is, if it's a distillery. And the uh, question number five, the final question, when I plan an itinerary, what products are available for the itinerary and how do I know about these products? And we'll get onto that in a moment. One thing to think about, and uh, Liz and Karen have both mentioned this a little bit, earlier as well is that no one's actually going to go to Scotland to just do one thing they're not going to go to your area to just visit one attraction or stay in one hotel you are going to have to think about what else is in your area so I'm giving an example here let's say you're a mountain biking company well when you talk to the trade the tour operator like me I'm going to want to know are there other activities so I can fill up the itinerary with different activities are there chauffeur companies that can take my passengers between the different activities? Is there a spa where you can relax and soothe your sore muscles at the end of the day? What kind of accommodation? Are there different types? Because maybe someone who's doing mountain biking will be looking for a yurt rather than a castle hotel. So good for you to know about these different things. And I always say when I do a presentation like this to um, a region is collaborate and promote each other and promote your region. The other activities or the other accommodation providers, they're not your competition. You will complement each other. If you're a three-star hotel, you're never going to convince a four-star guest to stay with you, but it will benefit the area if they come to the area. And if you, you know, if you are a mountain bike company, as we said, if you can convince people to come to your area, because there are other activities you're going to benefit from. So work together, collaborate. 
Okay, moving on to tour operators and the big question. How would you get on my radar? So if you are an accommodation provider or an activity or attraction, how will I know about you to feature you in one of my itineraries? Well, there are different ways. Obviously, I might meet you at a trade show. You might send me an email. You might ask for a call with me, etc. The one thing I would say, though, and I'm going to be really, really blunt here, and that is don't waste my time with things I'm not interested in. And what do I mean by that? Well, you wouldn't believe how many people approach me about product and it turns out it's a minimum number of 20. Okay, my maths might not be my biggest skill, but I mentioned at the start, I'm doing 16 seater coach tours. I'm not gonna be able to sneak four people into the boot of the coach. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be able to go to a place where I have to bring 20 people. So what you need to do is research the tour operators, research companies like myself before you contact us. And I mentioned earlier that we do schedule tours, but we also do FIT programs, but they're not on our website. So it's really important for you to also ask questions. So if you're meeting someone at a trade show or you're having a call with them, don't just launch into this fantastic sales spiel that Karen and Liz will help you develop. Start off by asking the tour operator, what's the tour operator looking for? Is there a good fit here? So find out about the tour operators before you start adapting your sales pitch to what they're looking for. Another thing, rates. Liz mentioned this before, have rates set up for the next two years. 2022 is almost over. We are now looking at 2023. I mean, by April, I am going to be finalizing my 2023 program. We are now also getting requests for 2024. So think ahead. Our lead in times are much longer than maybe you might expect. Also, make it easy for the tour operators to book and to pay because time is of essence. We don't have that many members of staff anymore. We want to make things smooth. Um, sometimes having to find your login details to log on your website and place the booking and all that might take too long. Sometimes it's easier if we can just send a quick email or pick up the phone. Just make it easy. Have different options for us when we book. Another thing that I know you are all developing is a product sheet. And it is so useful for me. When I'm planning an itinerary, I don't have the time to check out every website or pick up the phone to call you. But if I've met you, or if you've been in touch with me and you have sent me a product sheet, I will have that saved in my folder for your region. And I can go and have a look. And if that product sheet has the information that I need, happy days, I'm gonna be delighted. So what am I looking for? Well, I need to know what services and products do you offer. And be specific, have a good sales pitch, try and explain in one sentence what it is that you do so that I don't have to trawl through lots of text to figure it out. When are you available? What's your season? What are your timings? I run tours all year. You know, I, in the middle of the winter, we have coaches on the road. So I need to know seasonality, opening times, public rate and your trade rate or commission. If you're a accommodation provider, do you do static or dynamic pricing? Anything else useful? Do you have child restrictions? Is there a minimum number, etc.? Anything that I need to know. And also how to book and pay. If you have a product sheet with this kind of information, you are, tour operators are going to love you because it's going to make life so easy for us when we are sitting there planning itineraries. I can just look at that product sheet and base my decisions on that. So what I thought I'd do with you today, hopefully I have the time, I am going to um, show you an example of how, how I would plan an itinerary. And um, let's say I have to come up with a new type itinerary and there could be loads of different starting points for a new product. For example, Scott Rail, they may uh, approach me and say, we need to promote rail travel. Could you put a rail package together? Or Visit Scotland may call me in for a meeting and say, we need more winter people, visitors. Can you put some winter itineraries together? Or it could be that an agent, they might ask me, you know, to create a knitting self-drive itinerary. 
I might even feel inspired after meeting a supplier, maybe at a trade show or at an event like today. Or I might see a photo. And never underestimate the importance and the power of a good image. I'm a visual person, but also marketing people, we are going to want to market our tools. We're going to want images, not just for our website, but for newsletters, for blogs, etc. So if you have good, strong imagery that could actually inspire us to include you in our products. Some examples. Based on this one picture, I mean, I want to go there. I want to learn how to play Quidditch. Based on that one image, we have created a self-drive itinerary with a Harry Potter theme. I saw this image and I was like, well, yeah, I really want to take part in that whiskey tasting, but I don't want to drive. So I created a rail package based on food and drink, based on this image. This one image here made us create a day tour out of Aberdeen for our scheduled tours, the Northeast Coastal Trail, just so we could use this particular image in our promotional material. I'm sorry, but this image, I, I had a meeting with Visit Dairy, they showed me this image, I went home straight away and created a Dairy Girls Weekend package in, of dairy in Northern Ireland because I want one of these ducks. I have a bit of a collection, I want them. So just on this one image, a, a city break package. So to give you an example from your area here, let's say I saw this image and I thought, oh my God, I want to do that. I want to be in this area. I want to see dolphins. I want to learn more about dolphins. So how would I go about creating an itinerary around this? Well, first of all, I need to look at a map. I base it all on a map, obviously. And I have to figure out that that's where I can go to see the Scottish Dolphin Centre and learn more about dolphins. I then need to start figuring out what kind of itinerary is it and what other products are in the area. And I might think like, oh, well, spotting dolphins is an activity. I might want other activities. And luckily, while speaking to Liz, she mentioned that there's rafting on the River Findhorn. So Ace Adventures have got rafting. I'll put that into the itinerary as well. Or I might have met someone at a trade show that mentioned some boat building skills, traditional skills uh, kind of experience there at the, uh, I think they're called Cullen Sea School. So that rings a bell in my head and I might look at that product sheet and go, oh, is this something I could feature on the tour? And then I might think that, uh, well, we're in your area, we need to have some sort of whiskey, but let's do something different. Why not do the Cooperage, the Speyside Cooperage? We can do the VIP tour there, for example. And I might also think about other activities nearby. There's some archery, the House of Malden, or however you pronounce that is nearby. And this is where I kind of start trying to think about who have I spoken to? What have I heard of? What product shift do I have? What can I put in? And we need a little bit of heritage as well. Let's put in a castle. I think we've got the Balindaloch Castle. They do a lovely little garden tour as well. So that's nice. But at this stage, I don't know about you, but I'm getting thirsty. Cheers, I've got a cup of tea. But on this tour, I might want something else to drink. There's a brewery, windswept brewery. Let's put that in there as well. So now I've got all these different activities that I can include in the itinerary. I now need to start to consider how are people going to get here? And we have to be honest and acknowledge that Edinburgh and Glasgow are going to be the main gateways for international visitors. That's where they're gonna fly in. So I might need to, if it's a self-drive that I'm creating, I might need to start them in Glasgow or Edinburgh and drive up to your area. But luckily I work for Rabbits and we have departure points in both Inverness and Aberdeen. Perfect for your area. So looking at that, I'm thinking that this could easily be a nice little three-day tour out of Inverness. So what I then do is go through and look at a map, try and map out what I do day by day. I might put in some other things as well. And what I also need to figure out is if I'm doing a three day tour, I need to stay somewhere overnight. If it's a self drive and if it's a scheduled tour for me, I need to find somewhere where there's a choice of accommodation. So if people want a three star or a four star hotel, or if they want a hostel or a b and that can find it all in the same area. And I think for this type of itinerary, I think Elgin could be a, 
a good location. So that's when I've got an idea of my itinerary. I then start throwing in a bit of food, might need dinner some days, some photo stops and maybe some more heritage. And based on that, I can then create a nice little tour, stop in Findhorn, go to the brewery, stay in Elgin, visit the cathedral. We can then do a lovely little day tour the next day, do the dolphins and the boat building and the archery, have an activity day, and then head back to Inverness and do maybe the cooperage, the castle and the rafting on the way back. And all of a sudden, voila, we've got a three day tour of your area. So anyway, so that's my bit of the presentation, but I would like to end by giving you some final advice. And I would like to quote the very famous American philosopher, Vanilla Ice. And he said that stop, collaborate and listen, which I find extremely useful. What I would say is stop and develop your products, put a product sheet together, know what it is that you are promoting, before you approach us tour operators. Collaborate, find out what else is in your area, be prepared to answer questions, not just about your product, but other things to do. And listen, do your research on the tour operators, ask them the questions, find out about them before targeting them. So that's it for me, thank you so much. Thank you, Karen, that was fantastic. Nothing better than a real life experience of a tour operator working as we speak on probably 2025. Um, thank you very much. Um, we now move on to Expedia and Ewan and Rebecca. Are you able to share your presentation, guys? Yeah, well, okay. Fantastic. Cool. All right. You can see it. Yeah, you can see it. Cool. Yeah, perfect. Right. Thank you, Karen. Loved the walkthrough of the itinerary. It's, uh, that'll stay with me, definitely. Um, Jay, and thank you, Karen and Liz, for having us along today. So we're here to, to share by working with agents like Expedia can really help you target new customers and, and really grow your business. Um, so by way of introduction, so I'm Ewan Adams, so Area Manager for Expedia based in Scotland. So I've been with Expedia for just over 10 years. And then prior to that, I was 10 years at uh, creator and easy breaks and so on. So it's always been kind of hospitality and it's always been the accommodation side of things for me. Um, Rebecca, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, so hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I'm the account manager for Money and Speyside. I've been with Expedia just over six years. I've looked after the friends across Scotland. So I'm now looking after like the Highlands, Sky, Aberdeen and Dundee for a new challenge. I come from Expedia Street out of uni, so I don't have Ewan's um, past experience there. I used to work in service department, so a little bit different. Um, but yeah, that's me. Cool. Thanks, Rebecca. So yeah, so we'll do a quick intro on Expedia, and I'll touch a bit about some of the work we've done um, pushing Scotland as a whole. Um, I'll, I'll touch on the, the What Travellers Want survey, looking at current sentiment, uh, given the, the last couple of years. And then Rebecca is going to go into a bit more detail on money and space side and, and what exactly our customers are looking for and how you can be successful online. All right, so hopefully you're aware of Expedia. I think Matt had presented um, last year on, on Expedia. So um, Expedia are a whole host of brands. And again, there, there are probably a few names you recognize there, Hotels.com, Travago and Verbo being pretty active in the UK. But you can see that their brands are from all across the globe. And what it is we do, so essentially we bring, bring travellers to, to your door. So my family are from Isla on the West Coast and my cousin's a fisherman. And I remember having this conversation with my cousin. He, kept, he was trying to get his head around what do we do and, and why would people pay us to kind of get people to go to their hotels? And the way I put it to him was, well, he goes out every week and he's catching lobster and crab and so on. And then at the end of the week, he'll take that and he'll have to land it. And then that goes to a middleman who helps them export that and tends to go, the majority of it goes to Spain. But I was saying to him, well, what if you could kind of get your stuff sent to Brazil or Australia and kind of people paying you more for that? I said, Expedia is kind of like that. It's helping kind of accommodation providers or experiences reach out to kind of all the corners of the globe and really kind of target customers that you might not be able to do with your own marketing budget. Um, so bringing a, an entirely new kind of traveler to you. So how do we do that? So um, some big numbers on, on this slide. So I think the one for me is the 112 unique monthly visitors to 
uh, to our sites. So I mean, not far off double the population of the UK looking at our sites uh, every month. So it's an awful lot of eyes. So it's, it's, it's that exposure that you're, you're getting. And I think things like the translation of sites into 35 different languages. I know from my days at Career, it was painful experience getting translated into two or three web different languages. So um, having that kind of as, as a kind of solution now I find is, is pretty effective. Um, and although Rebecca and I both come from the accommodation side of things, Expedia is not just about accommodation, it's looking at kind of how people are going to get there. So it's your flights, it's your car hire, it's looking at people finding out what they can do when they get there. So kind of touching on Karen's uh, itineraries and so on there, like what experiences are, are they doing? And if we're thinking about those customers that are coming new to Murray and Speyside that don't have, a, like they've got no idea of the landscape and so on, we want to make sure that they've got all that information to hand to make those good decisions on and plan out their own itinerary, itineraries. Touching a bit about Expedia during the pandemic. So um, again, it was, it's been a horrendous couple of years. Um, and it was really good to see that we were able to do some small things to try and help the industry. So firstly, the, the marketing fund. So um, again, marketing credits. So when we did see business start to rebound, allowing kind of partners being able to target business, especially in their need periods. So um, looking at specific months or maybe target segments. So US travelers, that kind of thing um, was a really useful thing. Uh, the Group Academy for, again, people that were furloughed and so on, training on, say, revenue management and so on, picking up these skills. So um, I know that Scotland has a lot of that kind of stuff that goes on. And, and these kind of courses are really re relevant, especially when you're thinking about online bookability and revenue management, that kind of thing. Um, and then lastly, cancellation policies, taking your traveller focus, but also kind of you want to protect your business as well. So making sure you weren't losing those customers forever, but they were going to come back and the, the revenue was going to hit you um, eventually. Now looking a bit closer to home. So, um, so I think one thing that Visit Scotland did a fantastic job of during the, the pandemic was keeping kind of Scotland's voice well heard. So they, they kept up um, a lot of the marketing activities with Expedia and, and across the board. And what we actually saw, I was on a call a couple of weeks ago, we saw that Expedia's kind of, sorry, Scotland's share of voice among the other UK uh, regions and also some of the key European destinations that we compete against, we'd actually grown that share of voice and we've been able to maintain it. So all because of the great work that Visit Scotland's been doing and promoting Scotland as a whole. Thinking back to summer 2020 and summer 2021, uh, we launched the Only in Scotland campaign. So Visit Scotland and Expedia tie up, really targeting that UK, so the domestic traveller that we'd not really done before because, um, so it was a, a really interesting one because we, we wanted to convert, convert those people that maybe hadn't considered Scotland as a destination previously. Uh, tail end of last year, we've uh, launched the Scotland is Calling campaign. And this is going back to kind of our, our key target markets. So the US, Canada, um, and a couple of European destinations. And what was fantastic to see is that we saw almost an immediate bounce back of, of kind of people searching from the US and so on, as soon as we saw those lockdown restrictions lifted. Uh, in terms of sustainability, so projects that's close to my heart, so complementing Scotland's UNESCO trail, um, we wanted to make sure we're doing our part. So um, you may, or may have seen some, some PR lately on the UNESCO pledge site that um, they've launched. So this is a tie up with Expedia, um, Visit Scotland, local businesses um, and so on. And really it's about rewarding people that are businesses that are making really positive and concrete actions to, towards sustainability goals, giving them a platform to kind of share those, those stories and, and so on. So um, again, if you're interested in kind of finding out how you can promote the sustainable work that you're already doing, speak to Rebecca or myself and we can kind of point you in the right direction on that. Um, so before I pass over to Rebecca, I'll touch quickly on our, our What Travellers Want survey. So throughout the last, um, well, throughout the pandemic, we wanted to make sure we were gauging kind of what customer sentiment was um, and what was kind of the most important things to them when factoring in travel. Um, so the survey looks at, I think it's five and a half thousand people from across eight different countries. Um, and there were some kind of really common trends. And, and interestingly, things have changed a bit as we've gone through the pandemic. But these are the most current. So the, the results of these were just launched um, in January. So first and foremost is that flexibility. So Karen touched on it and it's looking at your cancellation policies. Now, this is not saying 
customers want to just be able to cancel any time and get uh, get full refunds. But I think it's about making sure when your product's online, is, there is that flexibility. So whether that be a 72-hour cancellation policy um, or partial deposit um, that's refundable, that, that kind of thing. Um, I think one benefit or one positive that's come out of the, the pandemic is that people are much more aware of cancellation policies now. So I think people actually read them and pay attention. So I think that's one positive, but I think it's making sure you know what your competitors are doing. Are you in line with them? Are you competitive um, when it comes to thinking about bookings? Um, next, and again, this slide is a bit of a double-edged sword. So this is looking at when do people think international travel will come back. Now, this is looking at where people live. So in the UK, we can see people are feeling a quite a bit more confident on international travel. Now, does that mean we're going to see less in the way of the domestic traveller coming up to money and space side? Perhaps. On the positive side of things, we're seeing France and Canada and Germany seeing the positivity there lift. So hopefully we can offset that with uh, some, some nice longer staying international travellers. Um, and then last thing, uh, like I say, this is a, a busier slide and we'll share the slides after, but uh, top right hand corner there, just talking about that sustainability piece with nearly 60% of um, travellers indicating that they would pay more for to make sure their, their trip was sustainable. So again, if you're doing work to make to be a sustainable business, make sure you're shouting about it on your own websites, on any kind of travel trade sites that you're working with um, and on sites like Expedia. And I'll pass over to Rebecca now to go into a bit more detail on money and, money and space. Thank you. Can save my slides. Um, so yes, as mentioned earlier, I'm Rebecca. Um, I'm going to run through some market trends that we've observed for the area. Before I start, just note that the date I'm sharing is based on bookings made within the month of January this year and any year over year stats compared to 2021. I know we're all working through that. So, um, yeah, next slide, Jen. So, first up, we've got a snapshot of production trends over the next 12 months. So, this graph shows the share of room nights generated for each month in 2022 based on bookings made in January. So, as expected, Room nights have increased year over year versus 2021, particularly during the first six months. We were either in lockdown or heavily restricted, especially during the first quarter of 2021. So while some of you I know stayed open for essential workers within that accommodation segment, we did see a drop in booking volumes. We do tend to see a relatively short lead in the area outside of those key holiday dates. So you can see that there that the room night share at the moment for February is, is high. This is due to a combination of corporate business and the February half term. We can then see you know, spikes in April and from June to August as we come into that stronger leisure booking period. School holidays, hopefully some domestic staycations and international guests booking much further in advance than that corporate traveller at the moment. Next up. So yeah, this second graph refers to average daily rates throughout the year. Whilst we expect kind of June to August, even early September to be strong, what's really interesting and key to highlight here is the increase year over year in average rates for October. So across the north of Scotland last year, we observed a much longer season than normal. More properties stayed open longer. The earlier lockdowns meant that both domestic and international travellers were open to travelling later in the year. So whilst it's early days, you know, we're still just into February, we are starting to see a similar picture this year with international guests in particular, booking after that kind of key summer period. Next slide. And just to follow on from the previous graphs, this snapshot just shows where we see production in each booking window and at what price. So as I mentioned in the last couple of slides there, the area is very strong with that short lead domestic booking. You can see that there that 35% at the moment are booking within a week of arrival. Corporate bookings drive production in the market in this short lead during the winter, early spring period. Um, I know from speaking to many of you that this ranges from kind of RAF business to manufacturing, construction and more. What's great obviously is that Murray and Speyside area sees a variety of corporate business. There's not just one industry type here, and that's been touched on already. Um, and something to consider, which again I know has been mentioned earlier, is demand pricing. So as you can see, the higher average rates are booked over a month in advance with the highest average rates booked over three months in advance. So, you know, how do you price your product or service to ensure that you're taking advantage of those high spenders booking further out and those that are booking much closer to check-in? Something to have a think about when you're setting your pricing strategy for your product or service. Bit of animation on that slide that I'd forgotten about. <laughs> um, so yeah, whilst the area is still very popular with domestic guests, 
around 75% of bookings in January were domestic. We are seeing year over year increase from key international markets. So these five are your, our biggest international markets. The longer haul destinations such as the US and Canada are growing the fastest, but the loosening of European restrictions is now starting to show the numbers with Germany, Sweden and the Netherlands completing the top five. As you had mentioned as well, we do have our Visit Scotland campaign, which does have a massive focus in on that US and Canadian business, which is reflected here too. So when are these international guests arriving? As you can see from that above slide, they're booking now predominantly for those high season dates between May and October, strong demand also in March and kind of early April. And um, as I mentioned before, you can see that spike in international demand for dates later in the year, a similar picture to last year when we saw the extension of that traditional high season. And hopefully we'll see a similar picture this year if you decide to stay open. Next one. So yeah, but what is so attractive about these travellers? So, you know, having a good mix of international versus domestic travellers has quite a few upsides. International travel, as you can see here, it attracts a particular type of customer. On average, one who spends typically more, books further in advance, cancels less and stays longer. Obviously, the can cancellation rates are likely to be slightly higher post-COVID as restrictions are changing all the time. Hopefully less of that now. Um, as you can see from a couple of those options, the booking window is twice as long. Um, you know, they're staying 106 days on average, based on 47 domestic, and they're booking much higher average rates. So you need to make sure that your property or your service is on the map, otherwise you're missing out on these valuable travellers. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so yeah, looking at our data, I just wanted to highlight a few common themes across the market. Many of these have already been mentioned already. Um, but one big one, make sure that your business offers flexibility. We're not saying bookings need to be fully refundable, but 99% of bookings made in the region for January were made on flexible cancellation policies. Now this ranges from, I've got quite a few properties that are spent with a week, two weeks, some at 24 hours. It does vary, but majority are booking flexibility. COVID hasn't gone away um, as much as we wish it has. It's, we're almost there. Um, make sure that you've got information on your COVID-19 policies and cleanliness as guests are still looking for that reassurance when they're booking products and services. And finally, um, 38, just over 38% of bookings are being made on mobile devices. As we know, people are never off their phone. I've grown up with it. Um, are you digital? You know, does your company have a mobile app or a mobile version of your website? This trend is likely to increase as we move through the next few years. So making sure that you're visible on mobile is key. Next one. So yeah, given the information that we've shared so far, we just wanted to finish up with a few tips and tricks to help you be more successful in the online space. So how are you making sure that you're meeting your customers' expectations? Do you have quality content online on a variety of platforms? The top reasons, um, and this is all part of the, the study that you had mentioned earlier, um, the top reasons that a traveller does rule out a property are bad reviews, poor descriptions and bad photos as well. So I'm now going to talk about these in a bit more detail and give some tips that can be helped improve your online visibility. And while some of these images contain specific Expedia products, the information and suggestions can be replicated across different products and services on a variety of platforms. Um, thanks for that, Ewan. So, yeah, not only do travellers have more choice, they've also got instant access to more information than ever before. And all of this information is readily accessible on any screen. So the average le leisure traveller visits many different sites before they're making a decision. And on each site, they're sorting through information, pictures, reviews, much more, and um, trying to determine which products or service suits their needs. Um, so two thirds of travellers report feeling overwhelmed too much choice when researching and planning a trip. They'll use filters to then narrow down the options to suit their needs. We also know 92% of travellers are more likely to book a property that does have detailed descriptions and pictures. So you can imagine it's super important to make sure you're providing that accurate content and photos that gives them the confidence to book your product or service. And as mentioned earlier on, remember that online is your virtual shop front. So does your content highlight your unique selling points? Are your photos up to date? Have you had a refurb and you've not put your new pictures online? You've spent all that money. Have you got that content there to reflect, reflect that? Um, are you visible on the right platforms? So we know customers are using social media. Are you visible there? Um, and as you mentioned earlier, sustainability is set to be super important in 2022. So 
60% of travellers seeking out more sustainable ways to travel. Make sure that your content reflects that. Next slide. Perfect. And finally, reviews. How important are they? Well, according to independent studies, 83%, so um, close to that, can 100% mark, um, usually reference reviews before booking, and over 50%, so over half, won't book a property that doesn't have any reviews. Management responses are really important as well, with 85% agreeing that a thoughtful response to a bad review can actually improve your impression of the property. So how do you make sure that you're engaging with your customers through their journey to create that positive guest experience? This will help you manage the online reputation as well. So the images on the presentation highlight tools that Expedia provides to help accommodation providers engage better with their guests throughout their journey. As we know, key to improving guest experience is always going to be communication. So how effectively are you communicating with your guests? Whilst we obviously have Expedia tools shown, um, improving the guest experience can be as simple as, you know, setting up some email templates to improve your communications with guests once they've booked. Um, you know, we would recommend opening lines of communication with guests once they've booked and prepare for their arrival. Do they need help with transport? You know, directions to the property, restaurant reservations. Can you upsell them? You know, bottle of wine in the room, a private over a group activity. And then how often are you actually communicating with your guests once they've checked in or once their experience has started? Communication during their stay or experience is also key. You know, it can help you discover and resolve any issues, putting you in the best position to turn that experience around. And finally, and the most well known, your post stay reviews. You know, are you contacting guests to encourage them to leave public reviews, TripAdvisor after their stay? Are you responding to all of these reviews, not just addressing the positive or negative reviews? You know, have you addressed any complaints or issues promptly as well? And the last one. Yeah, so, and that was all from Expedia um, from myself and Ewan. So, thanks so much for listening. We hope you find this information really useful um, and that's given a better understanding of how to engage with your customers in the online space. So, who they might be, who they're coming from. And yeah, as we've mentioned already, happy to answer questions if there's time later on. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Ewan. That was fantastic. Um, great to get all the insights about travel as well as the top tips. Um, so I'm sure everyone will find that really useful. We thought we might have a quick five minute pause if anyone wanted a comfort break or a cup of tea or whatever. So it is 15.20 now, just, just five minutes, 3.25 back um, for the final wee session. Great, thank you. Thank you. I think we should wrap yes. on here. Yes. Um, I think you will want to share the share presentation again. Share my screen. I yeah. absolutely will. Yes. Bear with right. me while I just get to the right part. Yeah. There we are. Oh, there we go. Right. <laughs> so um, thanks, everyone. We, are, we will crack on. Um, we will move fairly quickly on to Wilfred's presentation, but I just wanted to um, set the scene of, of, of reaching the travel trade. And um, firstly, you know, the first port, port of call is with Visit Murray Speyside. Um, they've been very active with the travel trade uh, for several years. So regionally, we're already on that journey and there's lots of ongoing B2B dialogues, live database, um, and you know, Laurie and the team are busy having these conversations about building product for tour operators for, for next year, the year after. Um, but and in addition to these business relationships, account management that they're, that they're doing, they will have um, workshops, including the Explore GB and Scotland Reconnect, the major um, British workshops reaching UK and international trade. Um, they, they are very active in bringing familiarisation trips into the region um which are very important in that business conversion and um they have done all this groundwork and now as laurie said at the very beginning need all the product in place in the right way so that they can actually um help with that conversion and deal with those referrals um into business into the region um and to be able to use that as a marketing tool so um 
so after that, then there's Visit Scotland, who are also obviously very active on the UK and international um, marketing scene on travel trade and consumer and um, a myriad of different uh, ways to to reach the trade, depending on how much time you have to invest. But we won't touch on that so much in this session, more in the next one in March as to, you know, other things you might get involved with. But you do also have um, contact with Cassie McEwen at Visit Scotland, who's your industry relationship person. And um, she um, is able to make sure that you're, you're, you're covered off in all these different areas, um, trade website, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I would just move on, Karen. So we'll talk more about how to work with the trade on your kind of one-to-one -one chats and um I mean, you've heard a lot from Karen and, and, and Expedia as to what's useful, but we'll talk more about that in the next session. Just generally before we, Karen, can you move on the slide just quickly? Thank you. Yeah, just, um, so really um, we, we didn't want to go into lots of statistics here. What we have seen, as you can see from Expedia, you know, the way the market's going, where the international visits are coming to, the fact that it's the, the qu third quarter is looking a bit busier. Um, we put a link in the presentation that you'll get just to visit Britain's forecast. You can see what they're saying about 2022-23. Um, you know, studies show that perhaps we'll be somewhere near normal in the next three to five years. But you could say, is there a pattern? Um, and it's very difficult to predict a pattern, which I'm sure you're all experiencing. So there's a lot of flux um, in the market, um, but you know, getting insights from from Expedia and from operators at the coalface is really, really useful. Um, there's uh, the Visit Scotland Consumer Tracker, which also gives you a bit of an insight into the UK market. You might want to have a look at that. You know, where you can see where that really um, kind of key domestic market is now turning its head a little bit towards overseas travel which we all knew was was bound to happen but it's it 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 will it will it will shift in so many ways we'll we'll not see a pattern for a while um we know there's that international markets are really key for long-term recovery and um, spend more stay longer as as rebecca was saying um and without going into statistics we know what the key international markets are for scotland and incidentally travel trade is coming through uk and international so we are covering we are looking at all of those key accounts. And one thing is certain um, is that Germany do, the Germans do want to travel. And um, I'd like to now move on to introduce um, our next speaker, who is Wilfred Klopping. He is uh, a number one Scotland fan, has worked with tour operators, um, has worked with um, Scottish regions and different businesses, accommodation, attractions, but I'm sure he will give us a real insight into the German market and the German speaking markets, I should say. So he, if I can hand over to you, Wilfred. Sure. Would you be able to ship? Perfect. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Welcome. Bill Common. Bill, Bill Common. Yeah, we'll come to that word in a minute. I'll share that screen with you. And here we go. Uh, so hello from Germany to everybody I already know and to those whom I don't know. I hope you can hear me well, uh, see the uh, slide. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy um, to have made it across the North Sea um, in spite of initial virtual problems there. Um, so uh, I can promise um, there won't be any more statistics uh, uh, from my side. Um, I've been in the tourism business for uh, more than 30 years, um, so I've had my experiences. And the reason that I've chosen this iconic uh, Craigillachie Bridge is, um, first of all, to tell you that uh, yes, you need to build a bridge between your business and uh, the German travel trade, even if there are sometimes obstacles, which you'll find in the picture uh, somewhere, uh, you need to either bypass them or eventually solve them. And you in Amore Speyside, you probably also have to build a bridge 
between Inverness Shire and Aberdeenshire, because you on your own uh, will have a hard time to market yourself independently to the travel trade. Okay, so that's for a start. Um, the key word or the key expression for me, if you want to get into the German market is local knowledge. And local knowledge to me means not only local knowledge about your region, uh, of course, about your business yourself, but first of all, about your own region, um, uh, the knowledge about your competitors and the knowledge which already Karin from Rabbi's mentioned, uh, some knowledge about the range of travel trade in Germany. Karin said that, uh, yes, you need to find out which operator you are going to approach. And that's most important of all. And hopefully by the end of my presentation, you will know why I think local knowledge is so important about the German market. And this is just an example. Um, when you think it is a football, it might not be a football for everybody. Um, so, and I have a few more of these. Uh, so hopefully you will uh, remember those. So um, in the tourism industry, um, I'm talking about local knowledge uh, by the provider. Uh, that is you. Um, of course, uh, know your own business, which I already mentioned, uh, but also your neighbors. And uh, please remember, and I also remember Karin saying, uh, your neighbors are not your competitors. And I'll come to that um, a little later. Uh, always remember in, in tourism that accommodation providers need attractions and vice versa. Nobody would stay with somebody if there is nothing to do or see. And attractions need restaurants, cafes, after they've had some activities. So it all interconnects. Uh, and that is exactly what uh, Karin also said um, when she was putting new itineraries together. And I might have uh, one or two new suggestions for Karin at the end. Um, other tourism services, of course, uh, in the area and hidden gems to surprise your guests is something very similar to the slogan which Rabbis uses, we go beyond the guidebooks. People do not want just a bed to sleep and to visit a castle or a garden. They are looking for something uh, which they didn't expect. So the slogan I think of Rabbis is well chosen. And I think uh, Maurice Speyside has something uh, to add. With regard to your neighbors and competitors, and you might hear that in my presentation a few times, and um, Liz already mentioned it briefly in, her, in, in the beginning, is um, the A9 in Scotland. Uh, your competitors are west of the A9. So in other words, uh, you need to not only build a bridge between Inverness Shire and Aberdeen Shire, you probably have to work together with uh, Angus and Five as well to get German visitors right off the A9 beyond uh, the fourth bridge to the right, to the east. Otherwise, if they reach Inverness, I can promise you that 95% of the Germans will go west because of Loch Ness. Okay, structure of the business uh, from Germany. Uh, yes, group business is almost 100% uh, dealt with by the travel trade. Uh, nobody is so foolish anymore to organize a group visit privately anymore. Um, just uh, imagine about the implications if there is a coach accident and you are the one who have booked that coach and it's probably your liability then. So 
all of the group business is actually handled through uh, operators. FIT business, again, uh, it has already been mentioned and explained also in the chat. Um, originally, these three letters come from tour operators, yes, and it meant fully inclusive tours. Fully inclusive tours meant when there was a flight, some accommodation uh, involved in a package or a ferry service and some accommodation. But it's much, much easier to remember what it means if you say it's for the independent traveler, because we are really talking about just individuals there. Uh, MICE business, I'm only mentioning uh, briefly here in this slide, because uh, and MICE stands for meetings, incentives, conferences, and events. So a totally different uh, market of the tourism industry. Um, there, is, there are travel shows for the MICE business, uh, but if some members uh, of Moray Space I'd have any questions about it, like for example, Gordon Castle or Innes House, uh, yes, do contact me. Consumer business, uh, yes, the colleagues from Expedia uh, take well care of that uh, type of business. Okay, group business, uh, just to let you know, when you are uh, approaching a tour operator or a tour operator is approaching you, uh, find out who that company is first. If you cannot find out, uh, please contact me. No problem whatsoever. Tour operators are usually operators which have a large number of tours to Scotland each year. Coach operators might have two or three dates per year that come. Uh, group organizers are often neglected because um, they are difficult to source, but there is a huge volume of business uh, behind it. Those are mainly uh, nonprofit organizations, and I'll tell you in a minute who they are. Again, uh, if you think it's a, a cup of tea, it might not be somebody else's cup of tea. Uh, think about uh, that as well whenever you try to promote yourself. Group business, again, the operators. You, we distinguish here in Germany between wholesalers. Wholesalers are companies that sell to coach operators. And when we are talking about wholesalers, there are some names like Beringer, Touristic, Service Reisen, One World Travel, Alpetour, CTS. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, have heard these names. Um, the tour operators are the ones which I've just uh, mentioned, mainly for uh, general touring, holidays uh, in Scotland. Specialized tour operators are uh, with a garden theme, a whiskey theme, and so forth. And their type of business is the following. Educational field trips, uh, really important uh, with young people. Uh, and I'll tell you a few figures in a minute. Study tours, yes, uh, Germans love to learn. Uh, when they are traveling, and uh, some people say they try to learn too much. City trips, round trips, yes, uh, Scotland is a typical uh, round trip destination. Um, but we need to work on the fact that too many round trips in Scotland are just between the triangle of Edinburgh, A9, Inverness, Loch Ness, Fort William Oban, uh, and Glasgow. Uh, there is more to Scotland, I think. Don't forget language courses and special interest tours, which I've already mentioned with garden tours, uh, castle tours. There are even companies in Germany that solely do biblical tours. Uh, and I'm sure you have uh, something to offer in that respect, not only because of Elgin Cathedral. I'm talking about this nonprofit organizations. 
just think about the fact that in Germany, we have more than 76,000 teachers of foreign languages. I would bet that two thirds of those are teachers of English as a second language. And where do those classes, groups travel? Uh, yes, anywhere English speaking and only very few to Malta. So the main uh, part of that business goes to the UK and Ireland. Incorporated societies, yes, a huge number of Vereine, which could be anything like sports clubs, choirs, angling clubs, anything. Third important, third uh, group would be these um, almost a thousand Volkshochschulen, like evening schools, or I think the US call them uh, divisions of continuing edu education. In all of those, you will find English courses. Um, just think about the five states of uh, Eastern Germany, which joined our country in 1989. Till that time, the first foreign language in these five German states was Russian. They haven't had English yet. So, and if they take a course at one of these evening schools, yes, they also want to travel and practice that. Um, and last but not important, not unimportant at all, church communities. More than 17,000 church communities in Germany. And some of those, I can tell you, are really very travel active. So within those group organizers, you will find a similar type of uh, group business. Um, the only difference here is uh, the summer camps for uh, church communities, um, because yes, there are uh, a large number of Germans leaving church as well. Um, but in general, the type of group business is uh, very similar. Just the origin of the business is different. Essentials for group business often talked about, yes, net tariffs. Um, for the travel trade is a must. Uh, free places, interestingly. Uh, and I've heard that you and you have worked for uh, Crera Hotels. I remember, uh, because I used to work for Crera Hotels as well, many, many moons ago. Um, there has been a time when Petty Crera tried to put away um, the free place for the coach driver. It was madness among uh, the, the German tour operators, how could he dare to take the free place away from the driver who brings the hotel the business? It would have been easy for him just to add an extra pound to his group rate, but not officially in their contracts uh, say no free place anymore. Uh, so think about those uh, uh, rules um, as well. In general, I think that um, Maurice Bayside has got some uh, lack of group space, if I may say so. Um, I understand that the eight acres in Elgin is currently even closed. Um, and But last thing, um, group business from Germany is very seasonal, April to October. Don't expect any coach groups uh, in January it's still too difficult uh, to sell because the prejudice of bad weather is still ex in existence. Again, um, Germans do love their dark bread. I just have to add that if you are an accommodation provider and if there is an artisan bakery uh, near you, uh, sometimes a Lidl or an Aldi does it, uh, that as well. Uh, you will have um, really shiny, uh, happy eyes in the morning if uh, there is some darker bread on the uh, breakfast table. FIT business for the independent travelers. Um, again, we have FIT wholesalers. Uh, wholesalers. I'm talking about companies like Voltas Reisen uh, in Bremen, 
ähm, der Tour in Frankfurt and uh, FTI, same three letters, but a slightly different order, FTI in Munich. And this is, again, a very uh, interesting uniqueness of the German travel trade. These FIT wholesalers, which I've just mentioned, sell still through more than 12,000 German travel agents. A lot of business in Germany is still done through the travel trade. Some of these 12,000 travel agents are owned by these wholesalers. That way they guarantee their sales through those agents. Yes, there is a trend to uh, online bookings, especially among the younger um, German community, but uh, travel agents are still a very strong. You still find them on the high street, which you sometimes don't do anymore in the UK, understand. And of course, you have uh, FIT special interest operators. If you have really a, something special to offer, uh, there are lots of German companies uh, like Bits in Berlin, it's Britain and Ireland Tourism Services, uh, British Travel Company in Frankfurt, some of you in the Speyside region might know the company Reisekulturen, uh, which do special interest uh, tours, FIT business in the whiskey uh, area. Okay. So, yes, um, commission to wholesalers. Uh, you might be um, afraid to recognize that figure 20%. But it's simply because those wholesalers sell to the travel agents who then sell it on to the consumer so that the wholesaler has 10% for him to keep and to forward the 10% to the travel agent who then de does the contract uh, with the uh, consumer. Information in German language, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, of my presentation, uh, do something uh, in German language, either uh, for the arrival of the guests at your uh, business, on, on your website. Everybody loves uh, some words in their mother tongue when they arrive. Um, if you uh, like the idea of how a... Um, German breakfast would look like if you travel a little bit further east of Moray, along the Moray coast. Uh, I'm sure most of you will know Pennon near Crivy and Gardenstown there. The Pennon Inn is meanwhile owned by a German couple. And one of their main feature is the German type of breakfast. You don't have to do it themselves just to get an idea because sometimes it's nice to get away uh, yourself as well. Okay, this uh, one should just tell you that we are um, coming to the end, so you'll get a, a treat from three different uh, countries. Okay, how to reach the German uh, consumer business? Of course, Expedia. Here we go. If you want to prepare uh, the business, uh, consumer business from Germany, um, always remember that sometimes the consumer uh, generates um, the uh, request for new um, itineraries. So if a, a tour operator is asked by uh, many consumers, why don't you offer this region or that re reason? I can bet on it that the tour operator will think about it. Another or a very good example of that is uh, for the German market, and some of you will know, uh, Devon and Cornwall is very, very popular with Germans because of a TV series. Simply that. And uh, that those TV series uh, have been written by a Scottish author, Rosamunde Pilcher, which hardly anybody in the UK knows, everybody in Germany knows. 
Okay, so um, think about a landing page in German on your website, or at least a German flag or the word Deutsch on your website. I can guarantee you that a German visitor to your website will click on that to find out at least some information in their mother tongue about you. If you get inquiries from German press or media, yes, do invite and host them if they do not come in August. Um, because it is sometimes as simple as that um, to spread the word uh, among um, the German um, population. Same thing applies, by the way, to photographers and camera teams. Camera teams are usually uh, TV production related. Um, and Karin from Rabbis mentioned how important uh, photos are. And if you are um, nice to these uh, guests, I'm sure uh, they will let you use some of their uh, images as well. Okay, trends in post-COVID times. Um, some of it is really common sense. Uh, some of it is um, unique to uh, the German market. Um, there is an advantage of packaged holidays for a lot of Germans, especially in, in post-COVID times, because a packaged holiday booked by a German a tour operator, FIT operator, uh, guarantees uh, them that if for some reason their holiday is canceled, they will get their money back. Because every German tour operator has to have a, an insurance and pay for it uh, to be covered in, uh, in case of insolvency or other uh, financial uh, difficulties. It is a very important reason for Germans to book through the travel trade. Also, always remember, um, English is not the mother tongue. So they are afraid of booking somewhere where the terms and conditions are not in German. The next are uh, common sense and uh, already mentioned uh, cottages and camping. Yes, because of the distance. Nature, slow travel, uh, mindfulness, uh, of course, um, and it has never even been uh, stronger than now, especially, especially that uh, we all know slow food, but slow travel has become popular. Um, and because um, people tend to stay longer uh, and it might not always be a round trip anymore. So if they decide to stay three or four nights in one place, maybe think about an incentive for them to stay the extra night uh, and to support uh, that. Sustainable travel has already been mentioned, local produce, something ideal which you have and which is not really promoted a lot is our farmers markets, for example. Yes, we do have these kinds of markets as well, but they are not as anywhere as popular as in your uh, country. And people will love to buy local produce and tell people um, at home about it. And the last thing I think is identical in the UK as well. Yes, there is a backlog to travel again. Uh, Germans have spent the last two years within Germany just like uh, UK people have spent their holidays within the UK, uh, but they are desperate to uh, travel abroad again. You probably just have to wait uh, a little bit longer. It was shown in one of the percentages of Rebecca that um, Germany will have a slow start. <laughs> we had a slow start of the vaccination uh, program as well. Um, but um, we are currently facing um, a quarter of a million new COVID cases within 24 hours. So that's a huge number. It is mainly due to that um, more than 20% of our pop population is not 
fully vaccinated yet, just on the, on the side of things. With 82 million, 20%, uh, that is still 16 million without being vaccinated. So that, and that's where the figures come from. So um, wait a little bit for us to come. Uh, I can promise you uh, we will come. Okay. Almost, almost the end. I promise it's um, uh, the last one. This uh, picture has got many, many messages for you. Uh, first of all, uh, if you are a tourism business, please uh, try to sell uh, emotions. Uh, it's not a, a spare part for a car. Holidays are always emotions which people love to talk about. They love to experience something. Um, it is also important um, that I've put in the bottle of uh, a West Coast whiskey distillery there. Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the West Coast is your main competitor. And that's the reason why the East Coast has been lacking behind for uh, so many years. One of the reasons could have been that um, the Scottish Tourist Board uh, might have advertised Scotland internationally for too long with Elindonan Castle and not Donata Castle. Um, the other competitor is uh, the bottle to the right uh, with regard to whiskey themed tours. Of course, the island of Isla is one of your main competitors because on this small island, you already have nine uh, distilleries. You have a lot more in, in Speyside, but Isla is doing a very, very good job in uh, promoting itself. And last but not least, um, the cute Nessie. Uh, again, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, Loch Ness is the utmost competitor of Maury's space site because a lot of people who reach Inverness from the A9 after having arrived in, 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 uh, in Edinburgh, which is a must say for many Germans if they visit Scotland, they all drive uh, A9. They have everything there. Uh, Pitlochy, Gateway to the Highlands, um, Blair Castle, um, House of Brewer, um, Dolwini Distillery. And once they reach um, Inverness, um, they do take uh, the left direction. And once they are there, you have lost them uh, for the east part of Scotland. Uh, so my uh, suggestion uh, would be, uh, yes, if Karen can think about a three-day tour uh, from Inverness uh, into Maury's space site. Uh, Karen, perhaps you can also think about a five-day tour uh, from and to Aberdeen, including Maury's space site, but also including um, Angus, uh, and there are lots of other attractions um, on the east side of Scotland, which the west side doesn't have. Um, Dundee has got the um, v &A Design Museum. Uh, Dundee will get a subsidiary of Eden Project over the next two or three years. So if your neighbors down south help you to get the visitors to the east side of Scotland, that is in your interest. Work with them. Okay, these are my uh, contact um, details. So feel free uh, to double check with me anytime you're not sure about an inquiry which you get uh, from uh, Germany, if you get a press a media inquiry, if you get a request for a, for a fam trip, um, if you need a German translation, uh, yes, I am bilingual. Um, I also run a series of podcasts. If you have got a German speaker uh, within your business or your region, yes, please contact me. 
And let's talk about uh, Maury Speyside uh, in one of my podcast episodes. Um, and last thing maybe, um, not only invite and host German tour operators when they come to Scotland, think about at some stage also uh, to join with uh, complementary uh, businesses in Maury Speyside and come to Germany. Visit German tour operators on their doorstep I can promise you that they will really appreciate that you are going the extra mile of coming to Germany to present your business to them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Wilfred, that was excellent. And um, giving us all a good flavor of the German visitor who is coming, <laughs> who is coming to Scotland. In the end, yeah. <laughs> no, they're coming. <laughs> They're definitely coming. Um, <laughs> um, thank you. No, that was really useful, I'm sure, for everybody to get so many different insights from different sides um, from, from, from the German market as well. So really moving on to question and answers. Um, if you've got any questions, we can you can unmute and ask them, or if you want to put them in the chat. We've, I know we've run a little bit over. We had those a bit tricky issues at the beginning that have set us back a little bit, but um, we are just really at the end of the presentation. So anyone? I've, I've got one that came to me in the chat. The person's had to depart, but I said it forward after. So Karen, I think this is maybe probably directed to yourself. Um, what to expect when negotiating a net contract with the DNC? Is it a legal contract or is it more of an email confirmation? What, what's, what are you guys using at the moment? Depends on if it's an accommodation provider or non-accommodation provider. So we'll That's say, a very good question. Yeah. Um, um, I am not entirely sure. It was Claudio. I don't know. Yeah. So, so basically, if, if it's a non-accommodation, if it's an attraction, we usually have just an email agreement with them. Okay. So we yeah. will ask them for details. They fill in the details and, and that's it. If it's for accommodation, we tend to... The accommodation provider tends to issue us a contract and we would just send kind of our terms and conditions to them. Perfect. But I would say for accommodation contract, yes. For transport, definitely contract because there's a lot of kind of um, implications when it comes to transport. So if you're a chauffeur drive or a coach company, but for if, if you're an attraction, just an email agreement tends to be okay. I think it was chauffeur drive actually, but we can yeah. take that up individually. Perfect. That's brand. Thank you. Um, I, I've got another big question for Expedia, please, this time. Um, you obviously, uh, Rebecca, were showing in your stats that, you know, there's a lot of shorter lead business around. A lot of that will be dictated by the corporate market this time of year. But, you know, your stats show that the um, overseas market do tend to put further in advance. What can the accommodation providers on the call be doing to encourage more of that advance booking? Um, you know, what would you recommend and suggest maybe to, to capture more of that further out market? Oh, can't hear you. So yeah, I think from what we're, when we're speaking to like our accommodation partners at, at the moment, it's making sure that you're kind of set up and visible so that these guests can actually like book with yourselves. You know, for us, it's we're looking at things like are properties set up on like the package path? You know, are they visible for guests that are booking as part of a package? Are they visible to that kind of international guest? You know, we've also got different models that guests can choose to pay in their own currencies online. So, you know, it's with that, especially with that overseas guest, and I know you and you can pop in as well, but um, especially at the moment, you know, we're doing a lot of work with Visit Scotland in terms of pushing the markets out to that kind of American, Canadian, European markets at the moment. Um, there's more upcoming. Um, I'm sure maybe you knows a little bit more than me on that side, but, you know, we are just making sure that our profit is visible. Do they have the right content? It is going right back to basics in some ways, you know, making sure that your content is appropriate for the, what these different guests are looking for. Like, um, obviously, Ravi's mentioned different guests are looking for different types of quality of accommodation and different things. So it's making sure that your content fits in with the international guests that you want to receive as well. Just to jump in there as well, it's funny because you think, oh, my content's my content and that's it. But actually, you want to make sure, say your amenities, for example, are set up for what an American guest would be looking for. And they're looking for, they love to see room sizes. So if you've not got room sizes there, they're potentially not going to book your property and they would go and book somewhere else. 
-hmm. So things like things like that that you might not think has that big an impact can have quite a big impact. Photos again, we can't stress enough. Like like the image says so much. So I mean, good photos. There are also then, and again, this is specific on our platform, but I'm sure on other platforms as well, things like kind of geo-specific promotions. So we could do, for example, you might say, right, actually for me, getting a guest coming from the US that's going to stay for four nights, that's quite a bit, that's valuable to me because I know they're going to be spending more in house. I know they're going to go and visit local restaurants. So to the wider economy, it's really valuable. So I might offer a slight discount on my rate to that customer specifically. So again, it's worth exploring any agent that you're working with, are there geo capabilities to be able to offer those specific campaigns? Perfect, thank you. So I don't think we've got any other questions that come in the chat, but if anybody wants to unmute themselves, ask anything, make any observations, any queries, please feel free to do so. I think we've, we've probably saturated you with so much information. <laughs> okay, well, I think what probably what we'll do, we just move on to our last sort of recap slide now, and then mm -hmm. you've got the contact details for Liz, myself, and Laurie and the team at Murray Speyside. So if there is anything else at all, don't hesitate to reach out. And I will just pop up the last slide. So, yeah, Liz, do you want me to just run through? Sorry. Uh, so yes, I'm here. <laughs> so for, just thank you all for attending. Thank you for our speakers. That's been fantastic to have your input, your insights, all your assistance. And thanks for you for attending. Um, I know everyone's very busy. Um, just where we are, where we're going. Um, so we're working on the Visit Murray Speyside Travel Trade uh, product guide, as you know, and Karen and I in contact with you just so we can get all that content in for uh, Laurie and um, for Rachel and you know that is what will be used um, come the uh, events at the at March April Explore and Visit Scotland Reconnect. Um, we'll we'll work on with that. 17th of March we really as had hoped to be in um, Forest this week this week but we're going to do a business surgery so we can just cover off all the things that individually people have that they'd like to discuss and we'll talk about international markets and markets and trends. Um, there will be a little toolkit that will pick up on some of the jargon that I know has been going around the chat box. Um, so we'll leave that with everyone. And, you know, just to focus the mind, uh, the big travel trade event in the UK, in Scotland, where we have international buyers, you know, 300, 400 buyers, will be the Visit Scotland, uh, Discover Scotland Trade Workshop, where... Laurie will be with this information and he will be able to work with and have business discussions um, taking forward your product, uh, whether you're there yourself, that's another thing, but he will also be doing the, doing the bit for the region. But that's it from us. Thank you very much. 